Hey out there, welcome to the Kevin Strong Show. Well, they have suspended the porch strike. So the guy who's in charge of all this, they get all this money for the union. I think his name is called Harold Daggett. What a piece of work. I think this is going to be a situation where the union workers under his leadership will win the battle but lose the war. And I will tell you why. On the second half of this video, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about stocks, some of the picks that I have um, executed over the week, uh, maybe about three or four of those, and kind of giving you my analysis of where I see pop, potentially where Bitcoin is going to go in the next seven to 14 days. So if you're new to the show, welcome. Start off by considering subscribing to the show, hitting the like button. I typically do release my videos once a week. So this guy's a piece of work. For those of you who don't know the uh, backdrop or the history behind all of this, uh, the guys were were, uh, were underpaid, 100%. Full disclosure, I am in the union, have been in the union for 15 years, was in a union in Ohio. So collectively, I've been involved with the union directly or indirectly for probably almost 25 years. It definitely has its pluses and minuses, but as I'll get into it later in the video, I think in the long run, this is not going to be a good look. So what the setup was, my understanding based on the research that I did, is that these guys on the East Coast were making like 86 grand. The port workers on the West Coast were making like 110, 111. There was around a 40 to 44% pay disparity between the two prospective coasts. They felt that uh, during the COVID um, crisis in 2020, all of these companies and, and, and the port entities made a crap load of money, didn't share the wealth with these workers, were working them hard, they were putting themselves at risk. So now it was time for them to get paid. No problem. So the the port offered roughly 40,000. I'm sorry, the port offered roughly a 40 percent raise. The union rejected that, said they wanted, I think, 70 over 70 percent of 77. The tentative suspension of the port union agreement right now is that tentatively the agreement is somewhere around 61 percent. And it got to iron out a little bit more details. So automation is going to be the key component where. I think in the long run, it's going to reflect that the union workers won the battle but lost the war. So I want to show you this clip from Value Entertainment talking about from Harold Gaggart's mouth how we're going to cripple the economy. Everybody's heard that word. This guy stays in a multi-million dollar house. He has a convertible Bentley. I think he makes collectively with, with his salary and some other stipend he has that's associate with, associated with his leadership. Over the union, it's roughly around a million dollars a year. But these port workers weren't even making a hundred thousand dollars. This is why I keep telling you folks, push away the left, push away the right, and everything will be all right. He's considered a top one percent earner, but yet and still the implied um message is that it's all about the union guy, and we got to take away all this money from the greedy. So enough about that. I've set this up long enough. Let's slide over here and watch this and look at this guy's house who claims to be representing the rank and file or the average blue collar worker. He's straight out of Soprano, straight up. Ah, so here we go. This always happens when I do this live. We're gonna just roll. I'll cripple you and you have no idea I will cripple you. what that means. When my men hit the streets from Maine to Texas, every single port, a lockdown. First week, be all over the news every night, boom, boom. Second week, guys who sell cars can't sell cars because the cars ain't coming in off the ships. They get laid off. Third week, malls start closing down. They can't get the goods from China. They go out of business. Construction workers get laid off because the materials aren't coming in. They lose their job. Everybody's hating the longshoremen now because now they realize how important our jobs are. I will cripple you. Okay. By the way, he's not lying. They have mm -hmm. a very, very important mm -hmm. job. Okay. Let me see if I can find. Now, he's talking about the kind of money they make. Rob, can you pull up his house? Speed this up there. I'm just moving it forward, ladies and gents, to the point in the video where um, value shows uh, this guy's house. Like, okay. So this is going back to a Bentley convertible. I mean, that's a five-car garage, outdoor sauna, brick pizza oven, 
you know, these rich people, right? You got to be careful oh, with these rich oh. people, right? But no, the point is this. This is a guy that's a union boss mm -hmm. who knows he has the leverage right now. Now they're going to talk about Made in port. So you want to be really careful about this. I believe longshoremen should get fair pay for the work they do. It's hazardous mm. and things like this. But you got to be careful pushing people too far. Otherwise, kids lose jobs at McDonald's to kiosks. And this happens. Well, this is coming no matter what, Tom. Yeah. This is coming. Amen. So here's my point. And some of you guys might disagree with this. Who in the hell is Harold Dagger or the rank and file of these port workers that he represents have the audacity, the unmitigated gall to want something in a contractual agreement between union and management that alleviates the implementation of automation. We all have to deal with automation. Even in law enforcement, automation has an integral part in the daily functions of a, of, of a job, of a, of a police officer. Everybody, teachers, doctors, everybody has to either adapt or succumb to automation, but they have the unmitigated gall to say, not only do we want a 77% raise, but we want to make sure that automation doesn't take over our jobs. Even though it can become more efficient, more cost effective, and thereby, in some cases, lowering prices of certain goods and services throughout the United States and worldwide. You just cannot make this stuff up. Just the gall of this. So I think what's going to happen I think the um, I think management management's going to capitulate in the short run. Hence, the union workers are going to win this battle, but they're going to lose the war because, like Pat was saying in that video, automation is coming, and they might do to them in 2025 and 2026 what UPS did to those damn workers. You want all this money? We're going to give it to you. But guess what? Now we're going to lay off thousands of people because it's going to happen. So, very 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 hot topic. Please comment below. Tell me what your opinion is on this. Are you pro or for against it? I'm not against these guys getting the wages that they want, but to put into the contract some kind of language basically saying w w automation. No, 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 because they want job protection. Everybody from a society standpoint has to adjust and evolve into automation. And I don't think they are, I don't think they are an exception to the rule. So without further ado, we're going to slide over here and now start talking about some stocks. I'm going to start off by giving you an update with the paper trading account because I have not shared that information with you uh, in about three weeks. So let me go ahead and bring that up. We're going to talk about that and then we're going to talk about um, some stocks as well. And let me give my mouse time to adjust here. Okay, so let me give you guys a quick recap on the account. My mouse is over here. About three weeks ago, we were at about three hundred and twelve thousand dollars, roughly three eleven, three twelve. So in three weeks, I made twenty thousand dollars on this paper trading account. Once again, this is not real money. This is simulated trading. That's why it says paper trading here, highlighted in yellow. But twenty thousand dollars in three weeks. Today, as you can see down here. The market's still open. I'm actually videotaping this thing live on Friday about 10, 20 a.m. I made $5,000 today. So when I click over here to the right where it says view transaction history, these were the trades within the last three weeks from September 18th on down. And obviously does not take into the account the trade that I just made today. So did a lot of things with the queues, you know, bought 100, sold 100. So these are basically bought, sold, bought, sold. So those are two transactions. Technically, if you want to be technical about it, you can say four, but I bought, then I sold, I bought, then I sold. So I'm going to consider that just one transactional evolution and the one that's not being shown up today. So roughly, we're going to say three transactions and three weeks, which is one trade per week. So collectively, when you put all that together in three weeks, we have grown this account from roughly 311 to 312,000, somewhere around there. You can go back and look at the tape to 331. Uh, so once again, hey, we'll see how things go. Those of you who've been following me on Facebook know that I've been on fire. I've only had one uh, account that was kind of a small loss, and I think it was Costco. I think I only lost like $35.
Okay, now we're gonna go over to some stock stuff and I'm gonna give finish up with um, talking about Bitcoin a little bit. And let's see here. So this was a stock earlier in the week. Stock symbol is AVGO, uh, Broadcom. I did very well on that. I forget exactly how high. I might've got like 20% return on this. As you guys know, I do option trading. Um, this thing is still moving up. It's in a good pattern here. You see there's a double bottom that forms here and it's rising up. And this is the nine day moving average, this white line. The uh, MACD uh, looks like it's not going to converge in a negative way. It looks like it's on its way up again. And it looks like the uh, RSI is already bottom starting to go up. So this stock potentially looks like it could move up uh a decent amount starting next week the caveat to that is that if the q's which basically handles a lot of the tech stocks the qqqs if they start to underperform and pull back next week they could potentially go down but as this is moving up that stock avgo should do well uh the one i'm in now um uh, i did a bear call on um domino's pizza it's okay right now. Uh, I sold options on this one. So basically where my thing is, I think I did a 430, 435. So my bear call spread is way up here in layman terms. So I don't confuse you. If by next Friday, this stock is, is at or below $430 a share, I will collect 100% of my premium. I'm looking for this thing to potentially pull back, hopefully Monday or Tuesday. And if so, I will cash out, hopefully at a decent profit margin. And I will obviously post that on Facebook. Another stock let's take a look at is Tesla. So uh, I shorted Tesla. You guys know that. I think I made 37% on that. As you can see here, this is a double top, which is an indication that it can't quite get higher than the previous high, which also typically not 100% guaranteed, but usually indicates that the stock is getting ready to roll over. You can see that the MACD is giving, giving you confirmation. Uh, right here, the last couple of days, you can see below here, the red, these red bars, these, these are daily candles. It's been daily. It's been negative daily. Uh, that's what the red indicates. And then obviously uh, you have the RSI that this is putting pressure down. So Tesla has done well. For those of you who follow me, about three weeks ago, I had said Tesla could hit 250, 260 by the end of the year. And it actually hit that. It's pulling back now. So that remains to be seen. Here was another stock that I did quite well on. I got out of it because I think I was already at like 30%, but this thing is killing it. I identified a double bottom. I said that it can go as high as around 109. It's at 114. And this thing is just cooking. If I had to guess, uh, it looks like the RSI right here. See here? This is all kind of like a leveling off. It's kind of like at a top level. Let me take my mouse here. See this here? I know I'm kind of talking fast. So to me, what that means is that that's resistance. I don't think the RSI is going to go too much higher than that. So what does that mean, Kevin? That means that this green line here, which is the 200-day moving average, you see where it's, it's at sell, sell, sell. I don't think this thing's going to go too much higher than about 115, even if it gets to that. It may not even make it to 115, but I think there's a chance it could roll over. Conversely, if it breaks through the 200-day moving average and establishes a strong base, this thing could take off quite a bit and probably hit like 120 or 121. Finally, last but not least, uh, Bitcoin. I don't talk about this that much, uh, but I thought it would be a good opportunity to give you some of my uh, stock analysis on Bitcoin. Once again, this is not um, financial advice. Why can't I get this thing to stop? There we go. Okay. All right. So a lot of things happen here in Bitcoin. Uh, I see a lot of things as a novice trader that maybe the person who really doesn't understand this stuff. Conventional wisdom says that even though Bitcoin is up today, it could pull back as low as 52,000 within the next seven to 10 days or the next seven to 14 days. Hey, Kevin, why do you say that? I want you to guys to follow me very closely because I'm going to teach you something that is a really, really good gem. So I'm going to pull this chart over here. And remember I told you um, this green line is the 200-day moving average. Well, since July of this year, 
every time a sell signal has come on for Bitcoin, it has went below the 200-day moving average. Once again, what represents the 200-day moving average, which is this solid green line? Sell below the green line. Sell in August below the green line. Sell August 27th below the green line. Sell. We're now below the green line. So why do you think it could potentially go to 52 or 54,000? Let's look at a couple of indicators. We've got the MACD confirmation that's already rolled over. See here, once again, we've got a high, which is resistance. It can't pretty much go any higher than that. It got rejected and it's rolling back down. Which is a little confusing here. This is the RSI. And it's kind of looking like it wants to curl up, but we haven't really got there yet. We don't have confirmation. So the MACD to me is a little bit more of a present value indicator as to where stocks are going to go. This thing could actually go up for a while before the stock actually responds to it. So getting back to my initial uh, point about why do I think Bitcoin could potentially go to um, 52,000. I gave you an example of every time since July of this year when the sell signal has gone on, Bitcoin has gone below its 200-day moving average, which is represented by the solid green line. As you can see right here, this is a base. See this here? That's baseline support. So what does that tell me? There's a good opportunity that Bitcoin could probably come down. Actually, I drew that too high up. It could probably come down around somewhere in here. 54 to 52,000, because guess what? Going back to July of this year, see how that's a support level? It hit that level, went up. It hit that level, went up. It hit that base level, went up. It could potentially come down. And if it does touch 54 to 52, and then, the, and then it starts to turn over and go upward, that can be a good opportunity. So how can you play this on a not so expensive um, trade? There's something called BITO which is a pro share ETF for Bitcoin. So if you think Bitcoin is going to go up, this would be your play. Which is interesting about this is that this is a doji candle. It's red. It's probably hard to see, which basically means that the buyers and sellers are fighting. That's why it's like a cross symbol. It doesn't really indicate negative or positive, even though it is red. What's also interesting here is that once again, the same thing with this RSI, it's at the bottom, but it's not nearly close to going up. And then looking at the MACD, the MACD has crossed down, which typically indicates a bearish move. So looking at a ETF proxy to Bitcoin, one could deduce that I'm not 100% sure Bitcoin's going to go up in the immediate future. It could potentially go down. So what is something that could give you indications about that? Here is an ETF that's a short. So if you want to short Bitcoin, which means that you think Bitcoin is start to go down, here's a cheaper option that you might want to play. Once again, this is only $7.61. This also is at a doji. But as you can see here, this is, has some momentum, some momentum to the upside. You can look at the MACD. The MACD is giving you a convergence on the way up, which just means this is positive. Plus, you have volume that's positive. You can look at the RSI, but the RSI is getting close to the top, but it hasn't topped off yet, which could indicate what, folks? We've got more room to go. So this is an ETF that's pro-Bitcoin. So if you want to play a cheaper version but still mimic certain patterns of Bitcoin. If you're a pro Bitcoin, you want the P, I'm sorry, the B I T O. B as in boy, I T O. If you think Bitcoin is not going to do well, then you want to play this ETF, which is B I T I. Where do I fall on all of this? I don't know. I, I'm just going to do some analysis over the weekend. The only trade that I am in is in Domino's Pizza. And like I said, I have a bear call spread. My short's at 430 and my long's at 435. So that's in a very, very good position. I don't see Domino's Pizza getting at or above $430 per share between now and next Friday. But if it gets close to my strike points, 
I will just sell out and give you either my plus or minus. So a little bit different. Sorry for a longer video. Um, I hope you guys are really appreciating the uh, the feedback I'm giving you guys in terms of stock picks. You know, I, I do a lot of transparency with that. And I want to finally leave you with um, a video. I forgot to show this to you. So I do apologize for this video being a little bit longer because it's funny. Some people will always comment on my Facebook page when I post um, my, my, my wins and losses. And within the last month, I've only had maybe like one loss or two losses or something like that. So I've, I've been doing pretty well. But it's funny that there's, there's a certain person that only comments when, when, it, when I show a loss. So, and I told you guys years ago, not years ago, but earlier in the year, in one day, I had lost close to, I think it was like $11,000 in one day. And it's not like I'm rich or anything. I was kind of like, ah, I just laughed it off because I know I can make it back up in the long run. But it's funny how people will home in on your mistakes, but they gloss over your successes. So I think this short video um, illustrates basically people who are just haters. So let me pull this up and then I promise I'll get you guys out of here. And I do appreciate you guys sticking with me and I hope you are enjoying the uh, content. Here we go. One day Albert Einstein was teaching a class and wrote on the board, nine times one equals nine. Nine times two equals 18. And he continued all the way up to nine times 10 equals 91. The class broke out in laughter because Einstein made a mistake. The correct answer to nine times 10 is obviously 90, not 91. And the students began to make fun of him. Einstein waited for everyone to be silent and then spoke. Despite the fact that I analyzed nine problems correctly, no one congratulated me. But when I made one mistake, everyone started laughing. This means that even if a person is successful, society will notice even the slightest mistake. So today's reminder to you is that mistakes are a part of the process. As Einstein once said, the only person who never makes a mistake is someone who does nothing. If you're not following the book, you're probably never going to see us again. But Right. So people say, oh, my God, Kevin, you lost ten thousand dollars in a day. So what? I mean, it's not like I'm rich, but I learned from it. I'll never do it again. Have I made that money back in various other ways? Absolutely. But we'll go out and buy a car for $60,000. Three years later, it's only worth $40,000. you have lost $20,000 in depreciation. It's a liability. It's not an asset. Every mile that you drive is a maintenance problem waiting to happen. We will embrace that because we like the way it makes us feel or when we get eye catching looks at a stop sign or at a stoplight from a perfectly stranger who we don't know we'll probably never see again. We embrace those type of purchases and we don't account for the monetary loss associated with eating up liabilities. But somebody that's losing money in a format that could potentially teach them a lifelong skill that could lead to financial independence, we choose to focus on hey, man, the stock market is just too risky for me. But I'll spend $2,000 a year on Starbucks. I'll spend $5,000 a year on fast food. I'll spend money on cars that don't appreciate. I'll buy all of this stuff that doesn't give me any type of residual value. It has no type of upside from a learning standpoint. But somebody else who's in a positive place learning life lessons for a long-term benefit, you can only focus on the here and now. It's just so myopic and so short-sighted. So I hope you've got a profound message from this video. I hope some of the stock analysis that I share with you in, encourage you to maybe take on your own journey and to learn how to do this even on a part-time basis to maybe even supplement your income. Because I've said this before and I will say it again, it is very powerful when you can click a button and then click it again and see 15, 20, 30, 100% return on your money go directly into your account. That is mobility, that is freedom, and it can't be beat and it's worth learning even on a part-time basis. So once again, thank you for hanging in for this very long edition of the Kevin Strong Show. If you enjoyed this content and you appreciated it, please do me the honor of considering leaving a comment hit the like button. And if you have not subscribed, consider subscribing to the 
Kevin Strong Show. Have a great weekend, ladies and gents, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.